Well, I believe it's just about 8 o'clock, and I think we're live. And I am, as always, Paul Flemperer, your host, here in this strange, surreal time we live in. I believe we're going into, hey Andy, I'll give shout outs randomly to whoever I see, as long as I got my eyeglasses on, Alonzo. From all parts of the world, all walks of life, we come together on a Sunday evening. Uh, in just a minute, I'll read some stories and various artifacts I'll share. Uh, but I think we're going into week nine. You know, please tell me if you've got any other information. I, um, on Wednesdays, I, you know, host from the moon, as some of you know, Space Force Jazz Lounge. And uh, it started out as just sort of a, just a funny idea, but it becomes, it's becoming more real as this uh, world we live in becomes more surreal. Broadcasting from the moon seems mm, just as rational as anything else going on. So anyway, I'll be doing that. But tonight, hey Tracy, hey Trudy, uh, I've got a few selections randomly chosen from my uh, trained chimp uh cohort here. Um, I was going to go with this theme of um, <clears throat> power and uh, the fluidity and um, irrationality of power, but uh, hey Tracy, but uh, I don't know if I'm going to get that specific, but I got a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but I think to get grounded, if you don't mind, I'm going to play a little bit of music just to start. It's more for my benefit, but hopefully Sounds will be soothing, whether they are words or notes. The words coming out of this thing. And um, it's, it's, once again, it's another edition of Shelter in Place Storytime. And the idea is it's Sunday. Um, traditionally, that would be the end of the week. But every day is today. So this is this evening, and then tomorrow will be today. But if you uh, like to have a little bracket for your you know, sunrise, sunset, wake up, make the coffee, figure out what the heck I'm doing. Sunday evening is shelter and play story time, a time to relax. Let the um, meditative energy just kind of percolate and get comfortable in whatever fashion that means, as long as well, we're all in our own place. So I can't see you, so that's fine. Whatever makes you comfortable, go ahead and do it. I'm going to play a little, um, this is just a little... Etude by Drouet in B minor, just to sort of start off the evening, little, almost like a palate cleanser, if you will.
I feel a little better now. Music to calm the savage breast, as they say. I hope you've got a little beverage to tide you over. Hank, Hank Shaw, man. Good to see you with us. Hey, Jimmy, Sharon. Um, yes, shelter in place story time, sips. So have something to sip and let's get right to it. Um, I'm gonna blow your mind. Well, maybe not, but I'm gonna take you on a little excursion through literature. And so I like to do weird stuff. Weird only in the sense that people, there's a lot of people that have lived and died and left artifacts to share with us. And I think it's always good. Hey, Floyd, Carolyn, it's always good to remind ourselves how different people can be, how many there are of us and have been. And uh, don't get too complacent with, you know, using your 20 word vocabulary or whatever gets you through the day. There's lots of stuff out there and that's what keeps it interesting. Greetings, Lon. Elbaz. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little Shakespeare from my giant William Shakespeare book. People ask me to tell them where I'm getting this from. So this is from Shakespeare. And um, I was looking for little bits and pieces about power. I thought power. It's in the news lately. Power. And uh, its uses. So <clears throat> this is from um, Measure for Measure. A little quick little scene. Um, Angelo, uh, an officer of the court, so to speak, sort of a bureaucrat, you know, trying to pursue justice. And uh, Aeschylus, who is more of a, an older statesman who uh, understands that everything's not black and white, I guess. That's all I'm going to give you. So, Angelo. We must not make a scarecrow of the law, setting it up to fear the birds of prey, and let it keep one shape, till custom make their perch and not their terror. Aeschylus. Aye, but yet let us be keen, and rather cut a little, than fall and bruise to death. Alas, this gentleman, whom I would save, had a most noble father. Let but your honor knew, know, whom I believe to be most straight in virtue, that in the working of your own affections, had time cohered with place, or place with wishing, or that the resolute acting of your blood could have attained the effect of your own purpose, whether you had not some time in your life erred in this point which now you censure him and pulled the law upon you. Angelo. Tis one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another to thing to fall. I not deny the jury passing on the prisoner's life may in the sworn twelve have a thief or two guiltier than him they try. What's open made to justice that justice seizes. What know the laws that thieves do pass on thieves? Tis very pregnant. The jewel that we find, we stoop and take it, because we see it. But what we do not see, we tread upon, and never think of it. You may not so extenuate his offense, for I have had such faults, but rather tell me when I, that censure him, do so offend, let mine own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come in partial. Sir, he must die. Aeschylus. Be it as your wisdom will. Angelo. Where is the provost? Provost comes. Here, if it like your honor. Angelo. See that Claudio be executed by nine tomorrow morning. Bring him his confessor. Let him be prepared, for that's the utmost of his pilgrimage. Aeschylus aside. Well, heaven forgive him. 
and forgive us all. Some rise by sin, and some by virtue fall. Some run from breaks of vice, and answer none. And some condemned for a fault alone. I thought that was apropos. I'm not going to say anybody, you know, uh, pot calling Kelly Black, Kettle Black, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, the news. Anyway, moving on. Greetings, Mark, Tom, Jeff. We're just getting started here. A little shelter-in-place story time for Sunday evening. Um, I'm going to get into some light fare in a minute, but I thought I'd just, like I said, I'm going to try to blow your mind. Because there's so much out there, and we get inundated with, like, you know, it's like you go to a buffet, and it's all, like, really badly made carbs to fill you up. And then you say, where's the protein? And uh, not that we're going to buffets these days. But one can feel that in the uh, the way the media comes at one, that you're getting force-fed, badly made carbs all the time. Uh, I don't feel so good. So anyway, just a reminder that there's a lot of people that have lived and died and created all kinds of works and shared knowledge and found things out. And so um, just to remind ourselves of that. And we're doing that. I appreciate that on Facebook. I think Facebook and social media in general has gotten a little bit more intelligent during this. Um, the sneeze shield has gotten more intelligent during this crisis because people are sharing more information, even though they're also sharing opinions. But anyway, I came across this. This is going to... If there are any scientists out there, my, my mother was a scientist, and she subscribed to this magazine when she was staying with me. It got delivered here, and um, I tried to look at it once in a while, and it just made me feel dumb, but I keep trying. It's called The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, PNAS. I know it's backwards, but PNAS. And they have really great subjects, but then you have to read it, and it's science, so it's going to be daunting. But I'm going to read a little bit. This is on the origins of domestic dogs. And it's science. I know, we, we like to have opinions, but here's some science. Um, and this is just a little bit, I'm just gonna read it very, just skim the surface. Genetic structure in village dogs reveals a Central Asian domestication origin. And there's a bazillion authors, uh, but here's the, the um, abstract. Dogs were the first domesticated species, originating at least 15,000 years ago from Eurasian gray wolves. Dogs today consist primarily of two specialized groups, a diverse set of nearly 400 pure breeds and a far more populous group of free-ranging animals adapted to a human commensal lifestyle, village dogs. Village dogs are more genetically diverse and ge geographically widespread than purebred dogs, making them vital for unraveling dog population history. Using a semi-custom 185,805 marker genotyping array, we conducted a large-scale survey of autosomal, mitochondrial, and Y-chromosome diversity in 4,676 purebred dogs from 161 breeds and 549 village dogs from 38 countries. Geographic structure shows both isolation and gene flow have shaped genetic diversity in village dog populations. Some populations, notably those in the Neotropics and the South Pacific, are almost completely derived from European stock, whereas others are clearly admixed between indigenous and European dogs. Importantly, many populations including those of Vietnam, India, and Egypt, show minimal evidence of European admixture. These populations exhibit a clear gradient of short-range linkage disequilibrium consistent with a Central Asian domestication origin. Got that? Village dogs. <laughs> we can all relate. Not to be confused with village people. And the genetics there is a little more complicated. 
Uh, I'm just going to read a few uh, paragraphs just to make myself uh, feel. I'm humbled. I'm humbled by this article. The domestic dog, Canis lupus familiaris, is found living with and around humans throughout the globe. Selective breeding of dogs has been practiced for thousands of years, but the majority of modern breeds are less than 200 years old and of European ancestry. Most dogs in the world are not purebred or even mixed breed dogs, but rather belong to free breeding human commensal populations, village dogs. The history and lineage of most modern breeds is well established, but the genetic relationships among village dog populations and between village dogs and breeds is less understood. Global surveys of mitochondrial and Y chromosome diversity in dogs have concluded that domestication occurred in south southern China less than 16,500 years uh, ago. <laughs> In contrast, the earliest archaeological evidence for dog-like canids occurs in Europe and Siberia, and uh, Mount haplotypes found in ancient and modern gray wolves appear to be consistent with an origin of dogs from Euro European wolves. These conflicting observations could be due to demographic processes after domestication, bottlenecks migration, and admixture. Altering patterns of genetic diversity or simply a consequence of a sparse archaeological record in East Asia during this period. Archaeologists and geneticists agree that dogs evolved from Eurasian gray wolves at least 15,000 years before common period, YBP. I forget what that means, but. But precise determination of the domestication origin is elusive. Uh, one more paragraph and then I'm just going to jump ship on this one. Whereas the Y and mitochondrial chromosomes are just two inherited loci, autosomal markers offer a vastly richer picture of the patterning of genetic variation genome-wide and better resolution for demographic in inference. Efforts to identify the basis of phenotypic diversity and genetic diseases in dogs have yielded large genomic data sets of purebred dogs readily available for demographic inference. Genomic comparisons of purebred dogs and wolves show Middle Eastern wolves have more haplotype sharing with dogs than other wolf populations, but this is largely due to dog-wolf introgression in the Middle East rather than an indication of Middle Eastern origins. So, you feel dumber yet? Anyway, that's what I grew up with. <laughs> uh, and I became a musician. Okay, that's enough. But if you'd like to, uh, I think the history of the dog is a very fascinating subject. And there's a, a good, I think it was a Nova or a television show called The History of the Dog. And uh, really... Not to give anything away, but the history of the dog is really also the history of humans. We co-evolved, which I think is fascinating. Fascinating. So when somebody says a dog is so human, it's more like saying a human is so doggy, really, because we're we co-evolved. All right. I'm going to take a slightly different tack now. I think my theme started out about power, but really it's more about how diverse human culture is, and we got to remember that or else we get... <laughs> Thanks. Good, some good comments there. Uh, we get caught up in how small-minded we can be. It's easy to get small. I'm thinking of Steve Martin, that whole routine. Um, I'm going to go dip into the uh, S.J. Perelman catalog, one of my favorite authors growing up. This is backwards, but... S. J. Perelman, and the book is called *The Rising Gorge*, and he uh, wrote for the New Yorker and uh, other art um, magazines. And uh, one of the things he <laughs> he used to do, which I really liked, was he'd find a newspaper clipping, and it would inspire some little flight of fancy, and he'd turn it into a story. So, um, the other thing you should know is he, this his book was published 
And these are little stories and snippets from 1942 to about 1960. So some of the references might be difficult if you're under the age of 60. <coughs> um, I'll, I might stop and explain if it's just, it's like reading Shakespeare, which I did. Sometimes you have to go to the glossary. Like, what is this word? It's, it's got more than two syllables. I don't understand. I know it's difficult in this day and age, but anyway, Eine kleine moth music. War on moths begins. The moths are beginning to eat. Even if the weather seems cool, this is their season for gluttony. Miss Rose Finkel, manager of Keystone Cleaners at 313 West 57th Street, urges that these precautions be taken. All winter clothes should be dry cleaned, even if no stains are apparent. Moths feast on soiled clothes, and if a garment has been worn several times in the last few months, it should be cleaned. Clean clothes may be kept in the closet in a plastic bag. It is safer, however, to send all woolens to a dry cleaner to put in cold storage. Customers should check to make sure that their clothes are really sent to a cold storage and not hung in the back of the store. The Times. So that's the news article. And now here's his story. Gayhead, Martha's Vineyard, Mass., July 14. Mr. Stanley Merlin, Busy Bee Cleaners, 161 McDougal Street, New York City. Dear Mr. Merlin, I heard on the radio this morning before I went for my swim that the heat in New York is catastrophic, but you wouldn't guess it up here. There is a dandy breeze at all times, and the salt water bathing, as you can imagine, is superlative. Miles of glorious white beach, marvelous breakers, rainbow-colored cliffs, in short, paradise. One feels so rested, so completely purified, that it seems profane to mention anything so sordid as dry cleaning. Hey, James. Oh, sorry. Still, that's not exactly your problem, is it? I have one that is. Do you, by chance, remember a tan gabardine suit I sent in to be pressed three or four years ago? It's a very expensive garment made of that changeable, shimmering material they call solari cloth. The reverse side is a reddish color, like cayenne pepper. During the British occupation of India, as you doubtless know, it was widely used for officers' dress uniforms. Anyway, I'm a trifle concerned last mo lest moths get into the closet where I left it in our apartment. The suit isn't really stained, mind you. There's just a faint smudge of lychee syrup on the right sleeve, about the size of your pinky, that I got in a Chinese restaurant last winter. I intend to only help you expunge it without too much friction. I mean, it's a pretty costly garment, and the nap could be damaged if some boob started rubbing it with pumice or whatever. Will you hence arrange to have your delivery boy pick up the suit at my flat any time next Thursday morning after 9.15? He'll have to show before 10.20, since the maid leaves on the dot, and would certainly split a gusset if she had to sit around a hot apartment waiting for a delivery boy. You know how they are, Mr. Merlin. Tell the boy to be sure and take the right suit. It's hanging next to one made of covert cloth with diagonal flat pockets, and as the Venetian blinds are drawn, he could easily make a mistake in the dark. Flotilla, the maid, is new, so I think I'd better explain which closet to look in. It's in the hall on his right when he stands facing the bedroom windows. If he stands facing the other way, naturally, it's on his left. The main thing, I tell him, is not to get rattled and look in the closet opposite, because there may be a gabardine suit in there without pockets, but that isn't the one I have reference to. Should Flotilla have gone, the visiting super will admit your boy to the flat if he arrives before 11. Otherwise, he is to press our landlord's bell, Coopersmith, in the next building and ask them for the key. They can't very well give it to him as they're in Amalfi, but they have a Yugoslav woman dusting for them, a highly intelligent person to whom he can explain the situation. This woman speaks English. After the suit is dry cleaned, which, I repeat, is not essential if you'll only brush the stain with a little moist flannel, 
make certain that it goes into cold storage at once. I read a piece in the newspaper recently that upset me. It quoted a prominent lady in your profession, a Miss Rose Finkel, to the effect that some dry cleaners have been known to hang such orders in the back of their store. You and I have had such a long, cordial relationship, Mr. Merlin, that I realize you'd never do anything so unethical, but I just thought I'd underscore it. Incidentally, and since I know what the temperature in your shop must be these days, let me pass on a couple of hot weather tips. Eat lots of curries. The spicier, the better. And try to take at least a three-hour siesta in the middle of the day. I learned this trick in India, where old Saul can be a cruel taskmaster indeed. There's also the place, you'll recall, where Solari cloth used to get a big play in officers' dress uniforms. Wears like iron, if you don't abuse it. With every good wish, yours sincerely, S.J. Perelman. Then the reply, <clears throat> New York City, July 22nd. Dear Mr. Perlman, I got your letter of instruction spelling everything out and was happy to hear what a glorious vacation you are enjoying in that paradise. I only hope you will be careful to not run any fish hooks in your hand or step in the undertow or sunburn your body so badly you lay in hospital. These troubles I personally don't have. I am a poor man with a wife and family to support, not like some people with stocks and bonds that they can sit in a resort all summer and look down their nose on the rest of humanity. Also, my pressing machine was out of commission two days, and we are short-handed. Except for this, everything is peaches and cream. I sent the boy over like he told me on Thursday. There was no sign of the maid, but for your information, he found a note under the door saying she has quit. She says you need a bulldozer, not a servant, and the pay is so small she can do better on relief. Your landlady, by the way, is back from Amalfi because some of the tenants, she didn't name names, are slow with the rent. She let the boy in the apartment, and while he was finding your red suit, she checked over the icebox and the stove, which she claims are very greasy. I am not criticizing your housekeeping, only reporting what she said. She also examined the mail in the bureau drawers to see if the post office was forwarding your bills, urgent telegrams, etc. I don't believe in telling a man his own business. Mine is dry cleaning, yours, I don't know what, but you're deceiving yourself about this Indian outfit you gave us. It was one big stain from top to bottom. Maybe you leaned up against the stove or the icebox. Just kidding. The plant used every kind of solvent they had. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me get back into character. <laughs> the plant used every kind of solvent they had on it. Benzene, naphtha, turpentine, even lighter fluid, and knocked out the spots all right. But I warn you beforehand, there are a few brownish rings. The lining was shot to begin with, so that will be no surprise to you. According to the label, you had the suit since 1944. If you want us to replace same, I can supply the first class all satin quarter lining for $91.50, workmanship included. Finally, buttons. Some of my beatnik customers wear this jacket open and don't need them. For a conservative man like yourself, I would advise spending another $8. As regards your worry about hiding cold storage articles in the back of my store, I am not now nor have I ever been a chiseler, and I defy you to prove different. Every season, like clockwork, I get one crackpot who expects me to be Santa Claus and haul his clothing up to the North Pole or someplace. My motto is, live and let live, which it certainly is not like this Rose Finkel's to go around destroying people's confidence in their dry cleaner. Who is she anyway? I had one of these experts working for me already in 1951 that nearly put me in the hands of the receivers. She told a good customer of ours, an artist, who brought in some hand-painted ties to be rainproofed to save his money and throw them in the Harlem River. To a client that showed her a dinner dress with a smear on the waist, she recommends the woman should go buy a bib. I am surprised that you, a high school graduate, a man that pretends to be intelligent, would listen to such poison. But in this business, you meet all kinds. Regards to the missus, yours truly, S. Merlin. And then the response. Hey, Jack, Kurt, Sharon. K-Head Mass, 
July 25th. Dear Mr. Merlin, while I'm altogether sympathetic to your plight and fully aware that your shop's an inferno at the moment, I myself am wearing an imported cashmere sweater as I write. I must say you misinterpreted my letter. My only motive in relaying Miss Stricture's Finkel's, excuse me, the strictures of Miss Finkel, on the subject of proper cold storage was concern for a favorite garment. I was not accusing you of duplicity, and I refuse to share the opinion widespread among persons who deal with them frequently that most dry cleaners are crooks. It is understandably somewhat off-putting to hear that my suit arrived at your establishment in ruinous condition, and, to be devastatingly candid, I wonder whether your boy may not have collided with a soup kitchen in transit. But each of us must answer to his own conscience, Merlin, and I am ready, if less than overjoyed, to regard yours as immaculate. Answering your question about Miss Finkel's identity, I have never laid eyes on her, needless to say, though reason dictates that if a distinguished newspaper like the Times publishes her counsel, she must be in authority. Furthermore, if the practice of withholding clothes from cold storage were uncommon, why would she have broached the subject at all? No, my friend, it is both useless and ungenerous of you to attempt to undermine Miss Finkel. From the way you lashed out at her, I deduce that she touched you on the raw, in a most vulnerable area of our relationship, and that brings me to the core of this communication. Nowhere in your letter is there any direct assertion that you did send my valuable Solari suit to storage, or, correlatively, that you are not hiding it in the back of the store. I treasure my peace of mind too much to sit up here and nod by anxiety. I must, therefore, demand from you a categorical statement by return airmail special delivery. In this, is this garment in your possession or not? Unless a definite answer is forthcoming within 48 hours, I shall be forced to take action. Yours truly, S.J. Perelman. Cousin Aunt Jan, Jack. New York City, July 27th. Dear Mr. Perlman, if all you can do with yourself in a summer place is hang indoors and write me love letters about Rose Finkel, I must say I have pity on you. Rose Finkel, Rose Finkel, why don't you marry this woman that you are so crazy about her? Then she could clean your suits at home and stick them in the icebox after she cleans that too. What do you want from me? Sometimes I think I am walking around in a dream. Look, I will do anything you say. Should I... Parcel post the suit to you so you can examine it under a microscope for holes? Should I board up my store, give the help a week free vacation in the mountains, and bring it to you personally in my Cadillac? I tell you once, twice, a million times, it went to cold storage. I didn't send it myself. I gave orders to my assistant, which she has been in my employ 11 years. From her, I have no secrets, and you neither. She told me about some of the mail she found in your pants. It is quite warm here today, but we are keeping busy and don't notice. My tailor collapsed last night with heat prostration, so I am handling alterations, pressing, ticketing, and hiding customers' property in the back of the store. Also looking up psychiatrists in the yellow pages. Yours truly, S. Merlin. Gayhead Mass, July 29th. Dear Mr. Merlin, my gravest doubts are at last confirmed. You are unable to say unequivocally, without tergiversating, tergiversating, that you saw my suit put into cold storage. Knowing full well that the apparel was irreplaceable, now that the British Raj has been supplanted, knowing that it was the keystone of my entire wardrobe, the sine qua non of sartorial taste, you deliberately entrusted it to your creature, a cat's paw, who you admit rifles my pockets as a matter of routine. Your airy disavowal of your responsibility, therefore, leaves me with but one alternative. By this same post, I am delegating a close friend of mine, Irving Weasel, to visit your place of business and ferret out the truth. Weasel? Ferret? You can lay your cards on the table with Weasel, or not, as you see fit. When he finishes with you, you will have neither cards nor table. It would be plainly superfluous at this crucial stage in our association to hark back to such petty and characteristic 
vandalism as your penchant for jabbing pins into my rainwear, pressing buttons halfway through lapels, and the like. If I pass over these details now, however, do not yield to exultation. I shall expatiate at length in the proper surrounding vis-a-vis -vis in court. Wishing you every success in your next vocation. Yours truly, S.J. Perelman. I've got to pause for a sip. <clears throat> I hope everybody can follow this. I know it's, it's high literature, written in the 1940s. He's having a correspondence with his dry cleaner. And uh, as you can imagine, it's getting heated. <clears throat> New York City, August 5th. Dear Ms. Perlman, Mr. Perlman, I hope you received by now from my radiologist the two x-rays. He printed your name with white ink on the ulcer, so you should be satisfied that you and you alone murdered me. I wanted him to print also, here lies an honest man that he slaved for years like a dog, schlepped through rain and snow to put bread in his children's mouths and see what gratitude a customer gave him. But he said there wasn't room. Are you satisfied? <laughs> Are you satisfied now, you Cossack, you? Even my radiologist is on your side. You didn't need to tell me in advance that Weasel was a friend of yours. It was stamped all over him the minute he walked in the store. Walked? He was, he was staggering from the highballs you and your bohemian cronies bathe in. No how-do-you-do explanations, nothing. Ran like a hooligan to the back and turned the whole stock upside down, pulled everything off the racks. I wouldn't mind he wrecked a, filling, a filing system it cost me hundreds of dollars to install. Before I could grab the man, he makes a beeline for the dressing room. So put yourself for a second in someone else's shoes. <coughs> a young, refined matron from Boston, first time in the village, is waiting for her dress to be spot-cleaned, quietly loafing through Harper's Bazaar. Suddenly a roughneck, for all she knows, a plain clothesman, a junkie, tears aside the curtain, your delegate weasel. I am not going to soil myself by calling you names. You are a sick man and besides on vacation, so we'll make you a proposition. You owe me for cleaning the suit, the destruction you caused in my racks, medical advice, and general aggravation. I owe you for the suit, which you might as well know is kaput. The cold storage people called me this morning. It seems like all the brownish rings in the material fell out, and they will not assume responsibility for a sieve. This evens up everything between us, and I trust that on your return, I will have the privilege of serving you and family as in years past. All work guaranteed. Invisible weaving, our specialty. Please remember me to your lovely wife. Sincerely yours, Stanley Merlin. Ha. <sighs> hey, Amber. Thanks for checking in. A little S.J. Perlman. I highly recommend him for if you want to get a little taste of American culture pre yeah whatever. Ah, back when people used words. All right, let's see. I've got a couple different stories I could read. How's everybody doing? By the way, I just want to check in. Getting through another another week. All right. As always, uh, I'm Paul Klemperer, and I do this every Sunday, Shelter in Place Storytime. Hey, Sammy, have a sip, Shelter in Place Storytime. Sips. And uh, you can, if, if at any time you say, I want to support this artiste, he's doing such great work. We really need him in this community. I can't imagine why we haven't been supporting him before. I'm going to write a check for $10,000 to help this young lad. If you want to do something like that, I wouldn't stop you. And I do have Venmo, Paul Klemper, and um, PayPal, me, 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 something like that. But uh, I just do this because I care. Uh, this isn't a great story, I'm just going to warn you, but it's from a book that I just love the title. It's called Half a Hundred Stories for Men, edited by Charles Grayson. Half a hundred! That sounds better than 50. And it was published in 1946. Uh, and this is just a little, a little ditty about 
uh, nepotism, and um, which in 1946 might have been sort of like, oh, ho, 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 and now it's like, is there any other kind of relationship in politics and business? I mean, they probably need a different word than nepotism because that has too many syllables for the people that are doing it. Anyway, I digress. <clears throat> this is called The Secret of Success by Donald Ogden Stewart. The young man in search of employment came at last to the inner shrine in that temple of modern business known as the Ellsworth Products Company. As he stood hesitating at the portals, one of the high priests advanced to meet him, chanting the greeting of his order. Mr. Ellsworth is a very busy man, a very busy man, he droned, and at each pronouncement of the name Ellsworth, the heads of the seven stenographic vestals in the office were reverently bowed. Stenographic vestals would be typists, back when they had typewriters. Five times that morning in five outer offices had the young man been told that Mr. Ellsworth was a very busy man. Five times had his letter of introduction carried him through the efficient obstacles which guard the inner temple from the eyes of infidel unbelievers. And now his pilgrimage ended. For the sixth and last time, he gave his name, Richard Kennedy, his business, an interview with the president <clears throat> regarding employment, his credentials, a letter of introduction from one of Mr. Ellsworth's friends. While this letter was being examined, young Kennedy reverently surveyed the temple. At one end was a huge mahogany desk, the entrance to the throne room. His gaze fell next upon the seven virgins busy at their consecrated stenographic tasks. One glance at these maidens told him that he was indeed on holy ground, for they were of such loveliness as belongs only in the offices of high executives. Kennedy had already, in the course of his pilgrimage, noted the significant business fact that standards of office furnishings and stenographic beauty increase progressively as one ascends in the scale of executive rank, exemplified in the present instance by the impressive early Georgian hangings and late Ziegfeldian typists of this office, as contrasted with the plain, chaste furniture and plainer, chaster stenographers of the lower departments. Get it? Sit down, Mr. Kennedy, said the President's private secretary. Mr. Ellsworth is a very busy man. Young Kennedy obediently took the designated chair outside the throne room door, from behind which he could hear at intervals a faint swishing noise. He idly wondered as to its cause, and one heretical thought which occurred to him before he could check himself was that it sounded somewhat like the noise made by the swinging of a golf club. His eye fell upon a magazine lying on a nearby desk. Efficiency, it was called. Efficiency, the journal of success. He picked it up and was soon deeply engrossed in a fascinating article concerning a businessman of Tacoma, Washington, who had actually eliminated 12 minutes wasted time per clerk day by the masterful ingenuity of having the fountain pens of his employees filled each evening by the night watchman. The next article, entitled How I Make Men Like Me, was by Abraham Nussbaum, sales manager for the Sutco Tire Company, illustrated with graphic and convincing photographs of Mr. Nussbaum caught in the very act of making men like him. The secret of my success, confessed Mr. Nussbaum, is personality, personality and pep. That's the stuff, boys. And farther on in the article, he gave this advice, radiate magnetism, envelop your customer with your personality, Practice at home before a mirror until you are sure that everything about you radiates personal magnetism. <clears throat> I think this is actually not that dated. Young Kennedy looked around for a mirror, but before he had time for any practice in the radiation of personal magnetism, the private secretary announced that Mr. Ellsworth was ready to see him. The swishing noise had ceased. All was silent behind the mahogany door. The high priest took the young man by the arm. A bell was struck, the seven vestals bowed their heads, the door swung open, and the worshipper beheld 
the great man seated on his throne. He stepped forward, trembling. The door closed behind him. Richard Kennedy stood alone before the president of the Ellsworth Products Company. Well, young man, said President Ellsworth directed at and President Ellsworth directed at Kennedy those keen eyes which, as described in the April m number of efficiency, seem to look right through you. Yes, sir, said young Kennedy, and then he added by way of explanation, Yes, sir. Well, young man, what do you want? The idea of wanting anything suddenly seemed so incredibly blasphemous to the young man that for a moment he was silent. Then he ventured to give his name, his request for employment, and his letter of introduction. Mr. Ellsworth adjusted an impressive pair of gold-rimmed eyeglasses to his nose and gravely examined the letter with that shrewd, keen glance which had so impressed the interviewer for efficiency. His shrewd, keen comment, You want a job, young man? After he had finished the letter, <clears throat> asking that young Kennedy be given a chance, showed that he had instantly grasped the fundamentals of the situation. Yes, sir, replied Kennedy, adding apologetically, I'm just out of college. President Ellsworth took off his eyeglasses. There was an impressive silence. Finally, the great man gravely clipped the end off a cigar, lighted it slowly, and spoke. Young man, when I first came to this city, I didn't have a cent. Not a penny. He paused and closed his eyes to let the full significance of this fact sink in upon young Kennedy. Young man, listen to me. The room was hushed. Was hushed. The smoke from President Ellsworth's cigar gradually settled around his head, covering him as with a cloud. Outside the building, all noise of traffic had ceased. The sky was darkened. Suddenly there came a terrific clap of thunder, and from the cloud surrounding President Ellsworth was heard a voice saying, Young man, there are three rules for business success. The first of these is, don't watch the clock. The second, don't be afraid of getting your hands dirty. And the third, work just a little harder than the other man. As he finished, the cloud ascended, and President Ellsworth sank back, exhausted. The young man, overcome with emotion, could not speak. It was one of those rare moments in which words are superfluous. His heart overflowed with joy that he, of all people, had been chosen to be the recipient of the great man's secret of success. It was Mr. Ellsworth who finally broke the silence. You will report to Mr. Augustus in Department 12 on Monday morning. The young man's eyes shone with gratitude as he thanked his patron. A bell rang, the door opened, and with bowed head, he backed out of the presence of the great man. How's everybody doing? Marilyn? Um, I think we're going to continue with this story. If anybody has any comments, thoughts, my theme eh, lightly was about power, and this kind of fits with this, but it was also about um, how much people have created so much information and culture and we have to remember that because we can get sucked into the vortex of our tiny, myopic, social media-driven crisis. What's the word I'm looking for? What feeds on crisis like, like it's some kind of nutrient, mm, almost like a parasite or a virus? <laughs> um, anyway, just get outside of that whole thing every now and then. That's what we're trying to do. Shelter in place story time. <clears throat> Take a sip. All right, he's going to report to Department 12. <clears throat> the following Monday, he who had miraculously received the three commandments descended from Mount Sinai and went to work as clerk number four in section number eight of Department number 12 of the Ellsworth Products Company at a salary of $15 per week. Inasmuch as Richard had never been good at penmanship or long division, this was probably considerably more than he at first merited. At the commencement of his business career, in fact on the very first morning, the young man came perilously near damnation. Forgetting in a moment of weakness the first commandment, Richard was just on the point of looking at the clock when he remembered. 
It was indeed a narrow escape, and he shuddered for weeks afterward every time he thought of it. The second commandment also caused him a great deal of real worry at first, for in spite of all his efforts, his hands were often quite clean. <clears throat> the observance of the third and last commandment, work harder than the other man, didn't seem quite so difficult. In fact, in Richard's department, it was almost suspiciously easy. After a few weeks of Richard's hard work, combined with his college education, began to have its effect on his superiors, and sometimes he was entrusted with the addition of three and four columns of figures, a responsibility which the young man assumed with a modesty and capability which greatly pleased the older heads. Richard did not spend his evenings in idle pleasure either, as did the young men who had not been so fortunate as to have been entrusted with the three secrets of success. He subscribed for the Benjamin Franklin course in business administration, and after reading 14 books, he was quite ready to take an executive position in any business. He knew what caused panics and just how to prevent them. He learned that the cost of labor and materials was apt to increase periodically, provided that some other factors did not cause a decrease. Mm. So they made him a clerk in the filing department, and he was entrusted with the stamping of the word filed with the date on every letter. This promotion did not, however, make Richard conceited, and his innate modesty won him many friends among the other employees with whom he was quite popular as soon as it became known that he was a friend of Mr. Ellsworth. One day, after Richard had been working for six months as filing clerk, he conceived an efficient idea for saving time. This was no less revolutionary a scheme than to cease stamping both the word filed and the date and simply imprint the latter in a certain definite place, which would, of course, signify that the correspondence had been filed on that date. Richard worked hard in perfecting this idea. He figured out that it would eliminate 302 movements of the clerk's arm in a day, which, allowing for Sundays, holidays, and half days on Saturdays, would mean the savings of 87,580 movements per arm, per clerk, per annum. When his idea was finally ready, he took it to his immediate superior, Mr. Wilkes. That's all right, said Mr. Wilkes, for he believed in encouraging young men up to a certain extent. But the routine book says that the correspondence must be distinctly stamped, filed. But, began Richard, and at that, the patient Mr. Wilkes took down the routine book and pointed to the exact page, section, and paragraph which supported his contention. This closed the argument. Or rather, it would have closed the argument had Richard been a less ambitious young man. But the more he thought about his idea, the more efficient it seemed. He discovered also that in his previous figuring, he had not allowed for the fact that the clerks worked overtime and all day Saturday during the winter months, which made his net total of saved clerk arm movements per person per annum 92,365 instead of 87,580. Fortified thus with an additional argument, this young Luther bravely contemplated nailing his thesis to the door of no less a person than President Ellsworth himself, but in several attempts he got no nearer that sacred portal than the office of the second assistant general manager, who coldly imparted to him the not entirely unknown fact that Mr. Ellsworth was a very busy man. Then, in his hour of despair, Richard remembered Abraham Nussbaum, the sales manager who had so successfully radiated personal magnetism in the pages of the Efficiency magazine. Three hours a night, for the next five nights, young Kennedy spent in front of a tall mirror with a copy of Nussbaum's article on How I Make Men Like Me spread out before him. On the morning of the sixth day, he was ready to try his skill. Behold, a magnetic smile at breakfast, and the waitress forgot to charge him for heavy cream on his cornflakes. Another smile through the window of the cafe, and a street sweeper outside ran in and embraced him. This last was rather embarrassing, and Richard deliberately shut off as much of the magnetism as possible until he could reach the office. But he was so charged with personality that four newsboys, two beggars, a plumber, and a traffic policeman 
followed him to the door of his office, overpoweringly attracted to this magnetic young man. In the office, his progress to the throne of President Ellsworth was triumphal. Managers, secretaries, stenographers all instantly liked him and made way before his Nussbaum smile. But as he stood alone before the president, all of young Kennedy's magnetism was promptly short-circuited by the great man's patriarchal impressiveness. Well, young man, said Mr. Ellsworth, fumbling among the papers. Yes, sir, said he. I am Richard Kennedy, sir. I have a plan which I have worked out for eliminating a great deal of unnecessary work in the clerical department, sir. It will save 92,365 movements of a clerk's arm in one year, and in ten years, during this speech, the president had continued the search among his papers. Suddenly, he fixed his shrewd, keen gaze on young Kennedy and said, Hmm. Then, before Richard could reply to this, the great man pressed a button, and a stenographer appeared. Miss Myers, said the president, did you see a little leather notebook of mine? There was a minute's silence. Richard trembled as he thought of the portentous possibilities of those notes, undoubtedly his complete record with the Ellsworth Products Company. The fatal little book was found and handed to Mr. Ellsworth. Young Kennedy, in dumb suspense, watched the features of the great man for any sign of hope. At last the president shook his head sadly and muttered, I ought to have had an 84, easily. Six strokes on number 12, a par three holds six. He looked up and saw young Kennedy. The shrewd, keen look returned instantly to his impressive features, which, in the previous moment of forgetfulness, had carelessly become quite human. You know, golf. Some people play it <laughs> a lot. But uh, anyway. Well, young man, he said, why, sir, replied Kennedy in stubborn desperation, I want to tell you about my plan for saving waste time in the clerical department. President Ellsworth took off his gold-rimmed eyeglasses and listened thoughtfully as Kennedy unfolded his scheme. When the young man had finished, he sat lost in deep thought for some time before he gave his answer. Young man, he said at last, when I first came to this city, I didn't have a cent, not a penny. He paused and closed his eyes to let the full significance of this fact sink in upon Kennedy before he resumed. Young man, there are three rules for business success. The first of these is don't watch the clock. The second, don't be afraid of getting your hands dirty. And the third, work just a little harder than the other man. The great man paused, then added, I hope that answers your question, young man. Yes, sir said Kennedy gratefully as he bowed out of the room. Thank you very much, sir. Kennedy returned from his second pilgrimage to the Oracle, greatly strengthened in his resolve to keep holy the three commandments on which hang all the laws of the prophets. Prophets. He realized more than ever before that it takes time and hard work to win true success. At the office, he set to his task with added zeal. In the evenings, he pored over his new correspondence course in modern business, which guaranteed executive ability and a handsome set of nine books for $65. But after a few months more, he began to grow restless. Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. And Tony, welcome. A success story in business from the 1940s. <clears throat> He felt that possibly he wasn't getting ahead as fast as he should. Somehow there wasn't at all the old thrill in adding figures, initialing correspondence, and in being efficient. Furthermore, there had been a distressing visit to a vocational expert. While perusing his beloved Efficiency magazine one evening, his attention had been caught by a full-page advertisement which demanded in big type, Young man, are you in the right job? Under this was a photograph which Kennedy supposed at first to be a horrible example of a young man not in the right job. More careful study showed it to be Morris Stuttgart, A.B., vocational expert, who for $25 would analyze your character and advise you at once as to your real life work. 
So Kennedy called on Mr. Stuttgart, and after sitting for half an hour in a strong light while the expert analyzed his character, he got a headache and the information that he had an unmistakable aptitude for a musical career. He thanked Mr. Stuttgart, paid his $25, and lay awake that night <clears throat> wondering why his parents had let him drop his piano lessons. The next noon, he sat at his desk trying to concentrate on the chapter in his business course concerning how to write effective business letters to Japan and China when Mr. Fisher sat down beside him to pick his teeth. Mr. Fisher was a kindly chief clerk who sported three 18-carat molars and a 14-carat watch charm, the latter a present from his fellow clerks on the anniversary of his 20th year with the Ellsworth Products Company. Well, Kennedy, what's new? Aren't married yet, are you? This was Mr. Fisher's daily question. Mr. Uh, Kennedy's daily answer was, well, not yet, Mr. Fisher. Can't get a girl to take me. How's Mrs. Fisher today? Kennedy had a sincere interest in the domestic welfare of his fellow employees and never faltered in his daily enthusiasm over the latest photo of the wife and kitties. Mr. Fisher shook his head mournfully. She had a bad night again with her stomach. Mr. Fisher's stomach, Mrs. Fisher's stomach, was a subject on which the whole office got minute daily reports. Then he added, What are you reading? Why, it's the Dearborn Business Corps. Pretty good, but I guess you can't get much out of books. It's the hard, practical experience that counts, isn't it? Kennedy possessed the modest attitude of amused contempt toward mere book learning, which college men diplomatically employ when speaking to those who are unfortunate enough to have Henry Ford's cultural background. Well, the Dearborn Courts is all right. Not as good, perhaps, as some others, replied Mr. Fisher, mentioning three or four names. What? You've taken all those correspondence courses, Mr. Fisher? said the amazed young man. <clears throat> Here was something wrong. Surely Mr. Fisher couldn't have absorbed all that knowledge as to how to be an executive and still remain a chief clerk. Oh, sure, I've read them all, was the answer. Well, tell me, have most of the clerks here taken the course? asked the young man. Sure, was the surprising answer. Long ago. Well, then, how about Mr. Schmidt? The mystified young man mentioned the name of one of the highest officials. Probably some handicap had kept the clerks from being executives. Quite likely, they had been clock watchers, or even worse, afraid of getting their hands dirty. Oh, Mr. Schmidt, said Mr. Fisher. Well, that's different. You see, he married Mrs. Mr. Ellsworth's oldest daughter. Certainly a dandy fellow, too, Mr. Schmidt. Calls me Ed, always joshing me about my kids. And Mr. Fisher chuckled reminiscently. Oh, said young Kennedy. He married Mr. Ellsworth's daughter? I see. And how about Mr. Spencer, the vice president? It was Mr. Spencer who had patted Richard several times approvingly on the back when he had found the young man studying during the noon hour. Spencer, say there's a regular man, replied Mr. Fisher. Nothing stuck up about him. He asked Bertha and I to his wedding. Married Kitty Ellsworth, you know, the old man's second daughter. My, it was some swell wedding. I'll, I'll tell the world. Yes, said the young man, it must have been. Then there came to him the vision of J.D. Ellsworth battling his sturdy way from poor boy to president. But, he said to Mr. Fisher, but how about Mr. Ellsworth? He came to this city without a cent, and by following three rules, he won his way to the top, told me so himself. Yes, sirree, said Mr. Fisher. That's just what he did. I can remember when he first came. I was his boss for a while. Used to say to him, John, do this now, or John, hurry up. There wasn't any Ellsworth Products Company then. It all belonged to old Walter Kennard. And then, when he died, it went to his daughter, Ethel. I guess you've met her. Why, no, where? said young Kennedy. She's Mrs. J.D. Ellsworth, the old man's wife, you know was the answer. The door of the office opened suddenly, and young Kennedy looked up at the sound of a woman's laugh. A plain young girl swept by them and passed into the inner sanctum. 
Say, isn't she a beauty? whispered Mr. Fisher with awe in his voice. Why, no, I wouldn't pick her out of a crowd. The young man listlessly surveyed the look, the book on business efficiency. The young man listlessly surveyed the book on business efficiency. Don't you know who she is? said Mr. Fisher. Why, some stenographer, I suppose, replied Kennedy. She's Ellsworth's youngest daughter, Grace, said Mr. Fisher, in the same tone of voice with which he would have mentioned the deity or John D. Rockefeller. What? Ellsworth's got another daughter? cried the young man, clutching Fisher's arm. Sure. Married? No, just nineteen. Oh, said young Kennedy. So he married her. Thirty-five years later, a trembling young man stood in the impressive office of Richard Kennedy, president of Kennedy, formerly the Ellsworth Products Company. Yes, sir, he said eagerly to Mr. Kennedy. I want to show you that a college man has started a problem and work up. President Kennedy took off his gold-rimmed eyeglasses. Young man, he said, lighting a cigar, when I first came to this city, I didn't have a penny, not a cent. He paused and closed his eyes to let the full significance of this fact sink in upon the young man. But I made three rules which I always followed. They are the secret of success. Yes, sir, said the young, the youth eagerly. The first rule is, don't watch the clock. The second, don't be afraid of getting your hands dirty. And the third, always work just a little harder than the other guy. The end. How to succeed in business. <clears throat> the old-fashioned way. Return to traditional values here in the year 2020. Yeah, see? Well, it's a little after nine. How's everybody doing? Tom? Um, yes, uh, I think I think I'm going to call it a day because I'm getting a little bit hoarse. All this raw emotion from these stories of uh, business success. But that had been our theme this evening, A, power, and it's <laughs> whatevers, and then also the, just the breadth of human culture and try to stay positive and look into um, other avenues of getting information, perhaps from a scientific journal. <laughs> yeah. Or you could just Google it. Dogs. Google it. Anyway, um, I have been your host, Paul Klemperer, and stay in touch. Uh, website, pksax.com. Uh, shelter in Place story time every Sunday evening. Space Force Jazz Lounge. I need to get my own flag because they're beating me to the punch. I don't know if you've seen the Space Force flag. I want one. I want one. Please support me, and together we can get our own flag. So I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. But Space Force Jazz Oh, other things I'm trying to work on. So, an email, pksaxhq at gmail.com. Good evening.